So that was my the question. So I I choose it and I got. So I I would like to to use this time as a kind of a sharing space uh, and a sharing experience of composing because I ask myself um, about setting the playground so, and I ask myself about aesthetics. So I'm not a philosopher, of course, I'm not a musicologist. So I, I thought that uh, what means for me aesthetics and for me it means doing, composing. So the relation, I would like to, to talk about the relationship of um, musical ideas and the realization of, of this. And for me, this question has three related, uh, related uh, questions. There are, um, why do we need a certain type of technology and uh, how and where do we look for it and how much time we spend on it? to create it. And for that, I, I would like to present two case study. And two case studies about, about my work, because it's the one I, I know, I think, better. And so um, the two case studies are about vocal distortion and vocal vibrato. And how those two elements have been accompanying me for a very long time. Uh, as, as background, I have been trained as a singer and so for me, voice and the production, the projection of voice is pretty much connected to my work as a composer. And so I spent a lot of time and I wrote uh, a lot of pieces uh, with four work related to voice. And then uh, at a certain point, I had the opportunity to, to dig uh, deeper to those questions during my research residency at IRCAM in 2017. And uh, the result of that uh, six month spread in one year uh, residencies has been the, re the, the, the composition of two pieces, the Cancioniere part one and part two, one for soprano percussion and love electronic and the other for vocal ensemble. So those two pieces are the background of the presentation because they contain in a way the application of the more scientific uh, research that I did. So the question is, is how technology relates to aesthetics, I think is pretty much connected to how we get and build tools and how we apply those tools to our composition. For that matter, I think that it is very important to me to say that the, uh, the research of the tools is absolutely connected to the artistic need. So for me, having two problems, how to create vocal distortion and how to create, uh, to manipulate vocal vibrato has been at the certain point and at the center point. And from that, I try to look out for, for tools. And so the first about the, the, the voice distortion, uh, I had the opportunity to make a singer a mezzo-soprano was able to have an incredible technique to, to, to produce distortion. These are three examples of what she has been, she's able to do. So one is, is what is a tremolo, we plus the glottis distortion, it sounds like this. Second one. And third one. Okay, those examples are without electronic, pure sound, just vocalizing. And so I was fascinated how I can can get it, how I can produce those sounds uh, with singers that are not trained with this specific uh, technique. And so 
um, I just want to show a sonogram how, how it looks when the singer is producing the, the, the effort. So we don't have steady partials because she's, to produce those sounds she needs a lot of time. And, and it's, it's very hard to control them. So the question is how we can compose with it behind or beyond uh, an improvisational context. So this is how it sounds. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and so to, uh, to, to, to make it clear, so when she is distorting really at the, at the peak point of the distortion, the partials are kind of having a chaotic behavior. And so the question is, is how I can produce uh, synthetically or, or not those kind, this kind of behavior uh, with, the, with the means of the electronic. And so the idea came by in, in studies that and a team at IRCAM was doing uh, regarding of real-time processing of roughness, meaning the distortion in a technical way. And so the idea was to have the distortion by amplitude modulation. This is how it looks like a normal, not distorted voice with a little bit of roughness. And so, if, if you, uh, as you can see around the around the partials, there are side bends. They are kind of a, a increasing the the, the 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 color of of the voice, and this is the roughness. And so, here is this, how it looks like the 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 uh, the voice with an amplitude modulation. And as a sake of information, at the end of this, of this work, as this produced a little bit of software uh, that includes that research that we made and the, is the way to, to you can, you can uh, actually produce those distortions by having this little software that is so available. And so, there has been a, a, an experimental validation, of course, for that, and so is the how it sounds the speech. There will be something missing. And going through the, the little software. There will be something missing. And uh, we have the singing voice. Try to find my way. Try to find my way. And with instruments. And so I want to go, go back to the origin of that, the, the, the friction, the difficulties that I have. So I'm going to show you that the result of uh, one and more years of, of research is started with that. So this is the original sound without distortion. Okay. And um, here we have the, the addition of three, what is called subharmonic, around the, the main partial, and it sounds just like this. And so the idea is, is how we get smooth transition between the place in which you have the roughness, so the distortion, and which you are not. So adding envelopes around uh, uh, fade in and fade out, basically. And then the chaotic behavior has been, in a way, um, simulated by the adding noise, but you can hear the, where the problem is on that. And, 
and so the problem in that on that matter is that you don't have the effort of the of the um, of the distortion. So when the singer is just singing plain, and then you add the effect, you have a discrepancy between the effect that you are you are uh, working with and the production of the voice. So the idea is that uh, to use the voice a slightly in an easy to do distorted voice plus the effect. So, and I wanted to just give you a few seconds of, uh, of the result of that, meaning that for me, in an important, in another important point of, of the aesthetics and the technology, that I, I think that you don't write a piece because you have to use a technology, but you have a musical idea and you try to integrate a tool to get your uh, musical idea uh, done in a way. And so it doesn't have to be evident or prominent, it just has to support your work and your musical idea. And that's the, the little example. Okay, another study case about distortion is that I work with a poet that has a special voice and I wanted to reproduce the mood, the state of that, of that voice. And this is the, the poet in question, reading her poem. And so here the idea was to recreate those, those, um, uh, those uh, dirtiness of the voice. And one proposition was to use a single, simple uh, ring modulation to have this connected to the um, um, uh, source filter creating the, the change of vowels within the, within the, uh, within the mouth. And so this is the vocal ensemble that to simulate the poet. So beside the, beside the question of how to notate the poet reading, there was the question how to hide, hide the, the, the hair and the, and the uh, uh, schmutzigkeit, uh, the, the dirtiness on the, on the voice. And so this is the result I came with. <laughs> So in that case, I would say that the, the tools, in a way, limited the, 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 the realization of what I was thinking, because of course, uh, having these tools made live, you can't change constantly the, the rate of the, of, of, the, of the modulation was complicated. And so in a way, I have to smooth out the original idea to the, to the practical uh, use of technology in, in a live concert situation. So here's the, here's the way that you spend the time to 
try to dig to find the tools and then you go back and compose also with that. So there is a back and forth process of, of, your, of, your, of your work. And so for the other kind of a, um, uh, state case, uh, study case, uh, the, my interest in vibrato came so, so many, many years ago because I tried to experiment with my own voice and uh, I wanted to show what kind of vibrato. For me, the idea was how I can I control the vibrato because when a, a trained singer starts put in motion the vibrato, there is a certain amount of variability, but you can't really do much with that. So you have limited possibility. And so this is how I try to fix it without electronic. This is another kind. Okay, this, this idea is this came so to control. I just push the hand here, so I'm doing kind of Okay, looks easy. For me it's easy. The problem is that a real trained singer the most of them, I, the, the, many of them that I work with, they are not able to do it for one reason, because they have here an incredible strong muscular apparatus that doesn't allow this flexibility. All the point is, is to be so stable here they can project the voice. So it's very hard. You have, <laughs> it doesn't come anything out. And so the question is, hmm, now I wrote an entire piece with that. Time to rehearsal. Nope. <laughs> nope. And, and that was it. And so there was a kind of a very practical need. So come up back to the, to the aesthetics. This is really something that I really want to do and I have no means to, to do it. So the, the idea uh, during the research I proposed is that there is, there is a possibility to, to synthesize a vibrato in the, in, in, with the synthesis modules uh, that have been already made. But the idea is, is how to control it. So first step, uh, the, the idea is, is that we have a soprano with, without vibrato and even if there is no vibrato, apparent vibrato, there is always a little bit of change. And then you have another soprano, let's say, with a lot of vibrato. The idea is, is to separate the stable part uh, from the unstable part, the variable part, and to discard, in a way, the uh, unstable part of the, of the soprano without a, a, a vibrato, and to, to uh, discard the stable part, meaning the pitch, to the, to the soprano uh, with a lot of vibrato, and to apply the vibrato to the soprano that has none. And so here is the result, an example. So here's the soprano without the vibrato. Here is the soprano with a lot of vibrato, no electronic, no synthesis. So she's not doing with that, but I can do. This is the way she, she wasn't able, but she wasn't able with that diaphragm movement. And so here is the synthesis result. And of course, it can be applied on different pitches, on different situations, different speeds. So the idea is that how I can manipulate the depth of the vibrato and how I can manipulate the speed of the vibrato. Manipulating the speed, I, I dig into the time stretch uh, question and I wanted to dig into the segmentation of the vibrato because if I can segment the original model, I could compose different 
um, segment of the vibrato, I really have the, the possibility to compose with it. And so the recomposition part. So just for the sake of the, of the story, to do this, I had to spend several months trying to have the basics of Python, because the entire program was written in Python, I have no idea what was that. And so to, to try to communicate with the scientific uh, person, so the ex expert, in a way, we start from a blank page, start coding, and I have to, to learn how to, how to express musical idea in, more, in a more, uh, I would say, scientific or very um, program, programming uh, language. And so here is the, the post compositional possibility. So if we take the depth of the vibrato, I can start to work with envelopes, giving an envelope to the, to the vibrato and transform it. And this is the result. And like I said, this precision in time is not possible during live performance and during, so even by, uh, it depends on how the singers what have sang before and what is going to sing after, which registers, so it's, it's really hard. So let's say that we have a, a a soprano is using her or her vibrato, and then I want to apply another vibrato when she's singing no vibrato, and so I want to put it there. And so this is the result. This is the original one. So the first is um, uh, natural, the second is synthetic. And so I started to work with envelopes in a way that I couldn't do it uh, to have the results in, in a natural way. And why not exaggerate if I need to? Okay, I make my case. <laughs> so, and um, um, let's say now I, I wanted to work with the speed of the vibrato, so the time stretch. And let's say I spare you 15 seconds, 14 seconds of tenuto, and I want to apply there four seconds of a kind of vibrato and six seconds of the current vibrato, and I want to put them. So here is the, the result without, so it's a synthesis, but without any time stretch. So I give it a factor of 1.3 uh, time stretch, th stretch, and this is the result. And of course, you really can't do have this in real time on a real soprano. On a, on a, and so I you can also apply envelopes to, to produce a uh, time stretch. Okay, at that time when I got this example, I said, wow, I, I, I succeed because it was really something that was near to what I did. And so now, what I do with that? So because I had starting point of having something that just looks like a tools I work with, and so the idea is that I wanted to really have the segmentation of my real model of vibrato, so I can really compose with that, and uh, I wanted to recompose the vibrato following predeter predetermined rhythmical structure, meaning projecting and uh, implementing a symbolic notation, so a real rhythm that I read, I, I wrote, and 
put it, <coughs> recompose this, this rhythmical structure on a vibrato. And I wanted to do real time. And so uh, after a certain amount of time, I could get an implementation of a, an object in Max uh, that do the, do the job. So the job real time was not the analysis of the vibrato, so I have to produce in advance the model of the vibrato, but I could apply it live, in live performance, the models that I have on the voice of the singer live. And so here's the, uh, the a session, a recording section of an excerpt of those of, of a piece. There were several pieces with, with the technique, and it's the, uh, the, the vocal ensemble that produced uh, this just singing plane. Oh. So the idea is that I could record in a buffer the place where they are not singing the vibrato and then uh, have two options, so recording and playing on top of that a model of vibrato and then maybe playing later like a polyphony uh, the buffer again and, play, and apply on that buffer the, the, the vibrato, so I have is a, a superposition of what was sang and a vibrato that was not there. And so uh, maybe three minutes of an example of the result of, of that, of that uh, construction and then I'm, I'm done. <laughs> And so we go back to case one. So the, the, the example that I wanted, the study case I wanted to make is this 
how was my approach I and mean, the story of this specific uh, specific project. But for me, raise the question is how where we look for for tools and how much time we spend and where is the starting point. So for that, I think that. I would like to, to share other stories and, uh, and also the perspective of the students. So how they, because this is a special case in a way, have the opportunity to have this research, six months help and uh, specific people that know how to do it, but we are often alone. So, and we can do some stuff. We can look outside where to find the tools that we have, how we do do that, how much time we spend and what for. question also so really for me because uh, I think that um, I tend to uh, to start with the really with the musical idea that is uh, almost independent of the electronic and almost independent of the uh, of the result meaning that working with a musician is often the starting point of a concrete working with sound with object and so, and little by little are coming and building idea. And so, um, I think that the, maybe it would be, I would say, is maybe cl a classical approach, meaning that still harmony and pitches and musical parameters, uh, uh, dynamics are pretty much important of that. And when they are not there, it's because it's a, a kind of a, a caution, a aware, awareness choice. Is kind of a, I don't want to use it. It's not because I have the tools that doesn't allow me to have pitch. That okay, now I write piece with with noise because really I, I if I want to work, I need pitch for that sound. I will try to find tools to to do it. So it's always like the. the the musical idea is coming always first. Then, honestly, when you start to work with the tools, new idea comes. So is it always a back and forth process? So I don't know if it answered the, yes, yes, the question. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, it was a lot of input and I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, when you were talking about the roughness parameter, um, I was wondering uh, how much uh, data did you collect from it, or how did you determine like, the, the bandwidth of the roughness? Is it something that was led by ear, by the artistic idea in the beginning, or how was the feedback in this situation? It's both ways, because the, the research was already started in that team specifically, but then I came in and uh, and uh, with the with the data with the recording I have, I could gather more um, information. So how this behavior and the tools that was developed was shaped by the knowledge I bring in, meaning that uh, the principle was to have uh, in a specific ra proportion ratios of the bandwidth around the partials, and then you say, okay, here's the tool. I, there was the scientific, let's say, the scientific proof was it by giving five uh, superficial, you get a roughness. It was the state of the art when I came in. And of course I asked for 25. 
And they say, oh, this composer always wants to do crazy things. There is no reason because it's enough having five supersonal around. But if I want to try with 25. And so the, the tools was built and I tried to play with that. And so there is a, a moment in which you out, completely outside the, the compositional task, you start to play and to, to test with that. And then where the collecting parameters, connections and combination of things came in. And so you spend really a lot of time trying to figure out how this is. And then was fixed in the in little software that you, you, that you see. So the parameter was really, uh, uh, and I have to add that there was a, a kind of a live testing, meaning with singers or me, say or singing something and testing in a, in a to, to simulate a live uh, situation. So there was really step by step process. So the, there was a scientific uh, background that was there. So how the tools work, the idea, but then was the, the artistic process. I mean, the, the, the idea, for example, of having envelope that change over time the, the, the rate of the roughness. So there is no something, and the, those kind of ideas came playing together and playing with the tools. Yeah, well, actually, I think you already answered my question, but my uh, question was, if you like compose more because of the lyrics or um, more because of uh, sound aesthetics, like how do you um, uh, decide how much um, technology you take into? Like, is it lyric related somehow? Uh, you said the beginning, I didn't get the beginning, the lyrics, you uh, said? Yeah, how much of your composing is related to lyrics? Like, um, lyrics? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I have to add a couple of things about that because the, the project, uh, there is the, the more artistic part, so the idea for me is to work with living poets. So I start to look, I was in a residency at uh, India, the United States, and. Uh, I started to interact with a, a poet that was there in the residence and she put me in contact with some American poets and I had other connections uh, in, uh, in Europe. So when I chose the, the, the text was because of the sound and I, I continue to work with that. For me, the, I realized after that the, the, what interested me the most is are all the poets, there are something to do with orality. So they, they uh, write, they, I discovered that after, so why I like this, more this and then more that. And it's because all of them are really connected to the performative act. So the way of writing poems is pretty much connected how it sounds. So the sound of the, of the voice, the sound of the words, and it's something that has fascinated me all the time. So I choose that poet before having any tools of that. And so was my starting point, and then, okay, what about this? And for me, the peculiarity of that poem was the, was the quality of the voice of the poem. And so that triggered the idea of a having to work with roughness and not the other way around. Yeah. Martha, um, you, you seem to, at least in the pieces or the examples you've given us, you seem to have shown a way of going from acoustic sound in particular voice into technology. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever consider that the, the voice and the instruments we work with are also a form of technology? In particular with the voice, what Simon Waters calls wetware. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got hardware, you've got software, and you've got wetware. Uh -huh. yeah? <laughs> um, and that somehow you could look at what hardware and software offers and then reflect that back onto the voice. Has that ever been part of your process? Yeah, yeah. because uh, I, does it for sake of time, so it, I couldn't, but I, I think that while I was writing the piece, those tools were made. Yeah. And so in a way, there was, and there was one and a fear process. Yeah. And so those one and a few problems were made by, because I like work like that. So I mean, it was a session of working and then I go back home and compose and go back to the studio and verify if it works and test it and, and et cetera. So I think, and, and then compose again. 
So the going back and forth, for, for me, is real the, the exciting thing. It's the, 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 and I think it's, I, not I, I, I doing the same even beyond the possibility to have access of those uh, tools, mm -hmm. even if it's a simple plugin. Uh, so is that okay? I have this idea. I tried, and then how will this inform my writing? Yeah. So the point of all this is, it's at least for me, is going back and forth yeah. Yeah. process. It's okay. not one way, but yeah. at least the same. But the starting point is always the web. The web. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, Th thank for the question, because yeah. actually, it's a, yeah, because I think that, and we heard a lot, uh, that I think that we share it, so that m making music is something extremely human, and even technology, yeah. so that we, we think that the mythology is that technology is something dry, something mm. so detached, but I think that the knowledge is served. The, the, the musical idea. So the reason is that for me, music ex is absolutely connected with the bodily experiences yeah. of sound. Yeah. As and as a singer is a kind of a yeah. ingrained yeah. in the in the in the thing. So <coughs> I am the, the instrument. And so I think I I realize kind of later in my compositional path that that's influenced the entire approach that I have to, to music, meaning that for me, the, the body, the experience I have of the sound is physical. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why it's, it's like this. And it speaks to me as a, as a starting point. I can't be, uh, going back to the Keen uh, presentation, I can't work with abstraction. I can't work, so, and I don't want to work with abstraction, with an idea or a theoretical, theoretical idea and go to the realization, but I need a physical relationship to sound, and then I'm fascinated to the abstraction that, oh, yeah. that okay. is the yeah. other way around. And yeah. so, in the same way, the choice I make to make this presentation is to date, okay, this is the doing, the making of things, what we can, as a, we made a step back, and we reflect, we, we try to think about what we are doing mm. after the fact. Mm. And for the next project, of course, we have the background, the story, the memory of what you discover, and you, of course, you apply it on them. Yeah, okay. So, no? After such a political and then philosophical answer, I have a very technical question. So um, in the time when you were actually distorting the signal and using amplitude modulation, no. It's, it, when, you, well, sorry, when you were using amplitude modulation, mm -hmm. no, uh, you were having different uh, sets of uh, subpartials there. Um, I was a bit uh, curious about what you were using as a modulator, because the carrier is the voice, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and uh, what was exactly the signal of all the modulation? There was the, the, the same, uh, it was, you have the carrier, but the modulation are the proportion the pro um, a set of proportions of the same sound. Oh, the so sound. the same sound is remodulated. So you were, it was not a sign or something that you were retrofit that the same signal. Okay. And and there are a set of kind of this was part of the studies of the scientific studies. So you have specific um, proportion mm -hmm. relationship of partials yeah. and how the how much. Of the of the same partial is reinjected to okay. create the subpartial. I now understand the results. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? I've got one. Yeah. Just while we are attending, while we are attending the stuff, um, getting out the vibe, uh, separating the vibrato from the from the from the plane was just plane frequency demodulation or what? Was sorry. The plane frequency demodulation or no. What? Is this pure synthesis? But the the vibrato. Yeah, but I mean, I mean the analysis part. They uh -huh. separate, they separate the vibrato from the uh, from the steady voice. Mm -hmm. The analysis part, not the synthesis part, but the analysis part. 
was it just playing frequency in modulation or did you invent something? No, it's a module that was developed by HERCOM, by the Super VPA analysis. Okay. Was was from that. Yeah. So it's a team based one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I've got another question. And I can't really look at that another question. But I'll ask I'll ask him for it. I'll ask it for him if he doesn't. Because I'm not on the ground. Um, Martha, you you spoke about what you did uh -huh. with your own voice. Yeah. More or less. And then the problems of dealing with singers who are basically superhuman in that area. Uh -huh. Did you ever did you ever work with singers that don't have that apparatus, that, that use microphones instead? So no. No. I don't. But it would be very, very interesting. Yeah. To, to work yeah, so people that use the voice a lot, but uh -huh. don't need that projection, so they don't have that obstruction <laughs> to you, right? This apparatus here. Yeah. yeah. If I can add to this question, I had it right from the beginning, anyway, you started to demonstrate it. Why didn't you do it by yourself? I did. I, I yeah. did, but I'm, I think that I prefer to be on the private spot, so yeah. sitting and be not on stage. That's why I think that I, my career diverged from being a singer to being a composer, because there I could have this, this reflection time and physical time all together. And I think what I, I would dream of is to have the possibility to work maybe with not professional yeah. singers and how to experiment with that. Because the problem is that, and, um, is the notation. It's not the notation of the vibrato, it's the notation of your music, because I'm used to, uh, to, to notate everything to the smallest detail. Yeah. But then when you start with that, you have to be ready to, to let it open. And it was the same question or problem when I worked with, for the distortion. For example, the singer, say, she was a professional singer, so having this special uh, technique. But then when it came to distortion, she said, Wait a minute, I, you can't notate it. You can't oblige me to, to do this and then this and then this. It's not a machine, it's not a button that you push and you get your distortion. So it needs to be open. And that, yeah. that was the question. I'm having these open right now because I'm thinking of Zappa. Did we have this discussion not here, but in another discussion? I'm not sure, maybe it's just me. Um, but that Zappa was very interested in, in speech rhythms, but he was very explicit about not being interested in notating them, but actually taking those rhythms um, in the context of blues, mm -hmm. how, they, how they come forth there, and injecting that experience and that performance practice into his performances, where notation plays almost no role in the, in the live situation. Yeah. Also sometimes do, right? but, but often not. Yeah. Um, is that something that... Yeah, I think that we, we touch the, the, the question, this is uh, a, a big one about what is music in a way, yeah. or composition. Yeah. So, and that I have mixed feeling in the sense that I, um, I like to think that composing is to writing the time and mm. dealing and manipulating time, so yeah. sound in time that is composed. Notation is an approximation. Mm. Uh, as we heard yesterday, I, I pretty much feel in that way, so, but in that appro approximation I can invent notations, mm. so in, it doesn't have to be this or the classical. So I, the fascinating things that you can invent notation to, that are adapt to the goals, mm. meaning for example the notation of the speaking voice, there are thousands of ways to notate speaking voice. And I chose this one because I thought it, for that project, in that moment, was the simplest, because it's important to be simple, I think, simplest way to get uh, something to play with to the, to, the, to the musician. But I know very well that this notation, without the recording that I provide, would give other results, and I'm open to it. So that is, a, again, is a question of choice. Uh, and the choice was and is, I know if I notate this on that, I will have this result. If I notate in another way, I have to be open to, to the wider range of results. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so 
And I, for my own practice, till now, uh, I think this is going to change, but till now I wasn't ready or prepared to, to, to have it completely open. Mm -hmm. So to, to have kind of a, uh, notate some ideas and to, okay, I'm going to, to a place and let's, let's build this thing. So I always, I have done this, but then I, I go back to the score. Yeah. Okay. And to the need to fix in a way for future performance. Uh, I'm not interested in if they are then really played again or not, but to 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 have the possibilities of to go back. And then go back to the other question that we had, so how much the notation of the electronic is important to reproduce it in a in a future. So this is all a question that really very and the obsolescence. Yeah, 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 what yeah, I've done, it's yeah. all there yeah, yeah. because in five years, it might be gone. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm asked a question. I'm sorry, just, just, just one, one, one question here now. Um, in this work, I mean, as soon as I heard what you were doing, I mean, my, 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 my brain was just flashing and taking us back to, to Stanford and Chowning and mm -hmm. his work on, on the synthesized voice, which mm -hmm. was so revolutionary and which led to. The FM synthesis, which we kind of heard in the most extreme example mm. here. Was there any discussion of this work, or, or, or um, was it at all important to the to the people working with Earcam or to you? Mm. I think it was assumed as a background, as assumed. history. Okay. So was yeah. is there, yeah. and we know that it is there, and so. But nothing more than that. No, no I think that it's something that. Um, yeah, it's like you know that it's there. It's part of your or your stratification, stratificate, stratified background, okay. and then you try to, to, because I think that the it is is another important question about technology and aesthetics that maybe I'm provocative, but even if the result seems to be like. If the tools is different, it can lead to other. Absolutely. And so uh, I think that the question, the need, the aesthetical, the artistical need, were very specific. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly uh, what I wanted to ask. Uh, as we're talking about technology, aesthetics, the voice and its possibilities has a certain aura of aesthetics and sound aesthetics. You could say, I call it a sound territory. Mm -hmm. And now that you apply tech technology, I, I felt it was more from practical reasons because you could not produce it with professional singers what you intend. But I had the feeling, and I, I just asked for a confirmation, that the use of technology in this case was uh, like to expand the human voice within the sound territory, not to make it something extraordinary. Because you gave one example that says exaggerate, mm -hmm. but I wasn't hearing anything like this yeah. in your example. Th thanks for the thanks for the the, 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 the question because uh, is the same also with the distortion, actually. Exactly. And I gave a lecture some time ago, it was, ha, huh. that was the first time I heard distortion not being destructive on the, on the sound. I don't want to destroy the sound, but it is something that is integrated. In the same way, I think this is project-based. So you have a, an idea, you build a, a tools, and then this tool is used for this, purpose, but then I know that this tool has another, a lot of possibility, potential. Yeah, that's a part of my question, because you stay within the sound territory. Are you using electronics in another yeah. project? Is it just like to build more on its own aesthetics? The sound territory which has something, we only call it, it sounds electronic, because it leaves the space of the voice. Yeah. It's still very interesting, it's like an extension which, which brings some new information. Yeah. Our space, our way of uh, you. Absolutely, absolutely. And there is a, another practical reason that uh, when you when you use new technology or new object, you you won't risk the entire piece on the entire things because those things were made by doing. And so you you know, okay, I test it till here because it's the safe very safe. The project boundary. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, but I think it's based, the project boundaries are made also by the stability of the system because you know that till there 
I tested it works. But then, so, and this is for me is the first step. Now I know that I can go there safely. How much further? Because, and also how much um, uh, efficiently I can go. For example, to, because there is a, all the question about the equipment, for example, 13 now speakers. How much time do you spend? Yeah. Not only by doing, but also by, by uh, realizing it. Because I was very fascinated to say, I use low technology. This is no low, low technology. It's very um, a complex setting. So my question now is how I can handle those things with an easier uh, settings and being efficient and I think this is the fascinating things of technology so how you you have the same object the same plug-in that you may be used thousand of time or FM modulation and you say okay how can I use it creativity in another way and that's where you would come to extend the boundaries in that case I, I wanted to to show how you the, the, the beginning of the process when you have an idea and you don't know exactly how to do it, are you gather tools that are not already there on the tools that are there. The, 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 the fascinating things is how you create your own tool instead of gathering tools that exist that might have the same result but not the same potentiality. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever felt safe with technology in any kind of performance. No. So the idea of finding a safe limit <laughs> And then feeling comfortable is completely foreign to me. But we should probably break, but maybe if someone feels we have urgent need to say something, last chance. Yeah, Did you ever try the, the roughness uh, self uh, modulation thing with the non harmonics? I'm spectrum? sorry, I don't, so, I don't know. So, uh, did you ever try the uh, roughness uh, object with non harmonic spectrum and monophonics or bells? And yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Next piece. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, Martha.